Hello, my name is Claudia Liza Vanderpoy. I am a journalist and presenter at Channel 5 News, and I'm here today at the University of Portsmouth to present and host uh, today's Life Solved Live. And today, the question is, technology, the great equaliser, or is it? And I'm so happy to be a part of this because uh, I grew up in a council estate in West London, brought up by a single mum. My mum's from West Africa, from Ghana. My dad is also from Ghana. He's living in Ghana. And this is something which is very important to me, talking about just breaking that divide when it comes to racial, economic uh, divides. And I'm really hoping going to have a good discussion today. My name is Ali Armelini. Uh, I was born in Montevideo, Uruguay. Um, I am Dean of Digital and Distributed Learning at the University of Portsmouth. I am here on Live Sold Live to discuss the implications of technology adoption in higher education, the challenges it generates, the opportunities it generates, and the future that we might look forward to. Hello, my name's Dr. Judith Fletcher-Brown. I'm a senior researcher and a senior lecturer at the University of Portsmouth. My research area is social marketing, which is all about using marketing to transform people's lives. And in particular, I'm investigating how mobile health technology can help women in India learn about breast cancer and the early warning signs to enable them to have a bit of equality in life. Hello, I'm Tom Ilube. I'm a technology entrepreneur and a philanthropist, uh, and I'm here today to talk about how technology and algorithms can have a profound influence on people's lives, um, whatever ethnic background they come from, and the way in which you have to think really quite carefully about the impact that algorithms and algorithmic bias can have on people's lives. I've got a question for you. Technology, the great equaliser, or is it? That is the question we are asking today, a question that was actually put forward by uh, Tom Alube. And the reason being is the world we live in right now. Uh, technology has come an incredible way, it's come so, so far. We have access to, to so much information, whether it be on education, whether it be on, on finance, technology, it's all there. However, with all the promise as to what technology could be and would be, has it actually reduced the divisions? The reason why we're having this discussion is because of Tom Alube. He brought this challenge to the University of Portsmouth and said, look, this is a discussion that we have to have. Uh, when it comes to technology. So Tom, thank you so much. But also congratulations on your honorary doctorate. I tend to look forwards rather than backwards and I'm excited and motivated about the future. Um, I'm fascinated by technology and I'm very interested in the range of technologies that will come in a wave over the next five, ten years and have a profound impact from the next wave of artificial intelligence, machine learning, the metaverse, quantum computing. In a way, I think the set of technologies that will hit society over the next 10 years will have an even more profound impact on society than what we've seen to date. You know, the next 10 years are really, really important. And then when I look at that and I think about the impact that those technologies have on human interactions and relationships, and if, if I can sort of give you a couple of examples. One is quite a personal example where I had uh, and my family had lost contact with uh, a sister that I barely knew that I had. And you know, she was born sort of 30 odd years ago, possibly, well, longer now, uh, probably 40 years ago. And we had no contact with her, whatever, in, in Uganda, in East Africa. Uh, and then about 15 years ago, 10, 10 years ago, I set out to find her. And it was a long journey and very complicated. 
But using technology, using the internet, using all of these tools, I eventually managed to find her, managed to reunite with her. It was transformational to her life, transformational to my life, really profound, and wouldn't have happened without technology. So there you have an example of just the, the profound benefits that technology can bring. On the other side, uh, you've got issues of algorithms that are being used in the US criminal justice system, in the health sector, in facial recognition, that can lead to consequences, particularly amongst different ethnic minority groups, that are profoundly bad for their lives uh, as well, uh, as a result of things going the wrong way. And therefore, you have this situation where we have an increasing wave of increasingly powerful technology hitting society that can have profoundly good or profoundly bad impacts, completely unintended in, in, in many situations. And there isn't a lot of discussion. There's some discussion, but there isn't a lot of discussion and debate about how we address that and how we make sure that the outcomes are much more oriented towards the positive and the good and how we watch out for the bad effects and address them. So that's what motivates the issue for me. No, it's a very, very, very important discussion to have, particularly if it's not being had as much as it should be. But Judith, you are very familiar with some of the bias you could say uh, people, people can experience when using technology or trying to access uh, areas of life. Uh, and this is because of your own personal experience uh, when it came to accessing technology. And you had a, a very good personal experience, but it brought you uh, brought the attention to your attention that actually there are some negative aspects people are being, experiencing in other parts of the world. Yes, yes, that's right. So my um, research area is looking at how new technology can help women um, understand about the early warning, warning signs of breast cancer in India. And that started really from my very own experience um, when at the age of 47 um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And being sort of an independent woman in a Western democracy, uh, economically independent, I was knowledgeable. I, had, I knew where to go and access those resources. I knew what the early warning signs were like. You know, we're, we're brought up um, even today in school, which is really good, about how to self-examine ourselves and things like that. So um, within about two or three weeks, I had gone to the doctors, I'd been to the hospital, I'd been diagnosed, I'd had my uh, scans, my biopsies, my blood tests, all new technology, all facilitating that process. And my, um, you know, my plan for, for chemotherapy, my reconstruction was all planned, all through, um, all through, all through technology. And then after I'd had that, as a kind of a reward for recovery, my sister took me on holiday to India. And I don't know if anyone's been to India in the audience. Yes, they're all nodding, they're all nodding, you know. And um, I'm sure you experience the same as I did when you, when you walk there, if you've been to India. It's just an amazing, amazing country. It's full of sounds, it's colourful, the food's brilliant. But the most important thing I really, really enjoyed the most were the people. The people were really friendly, um, there were lots and lots of young people, I mean it's the biggest democracy in the world, it's got over a billion people, um, its best resource is its, is its people, you know, something like 40% of people in um, India are under the age of 30, can you imagine that? It's so resourceful. Anyway, so as we're traveling around, I'm sort of thinking, you know, bearing in mind I've just had this experience of a lifetime, I'm sort of thinking, well, what happens to that woman is she, that's going into that lovely, shiny new office block in New Delhi or, or that woman that's, you know, working over there in a shop or in a, in a field? What happens to her if she finds out that she's got breast cancer? So when I came home and I started scoping the problem, I was really, really shocked. I mean, at the time, um, in about uh, whenever it was, uh, when I started my research in 2018, India was the fourth wealthiest country in the world. It's only the sixth now. It's six. It's only just below us. It's an amazing wealthy country. But I was really shocked at the statistics that the breast cancer rates were at epidemic proportions. And I just couldn't get my head around that. And the reason why it was, was lack of awareness. Um, and lack of awareness because of cultural constraints. 
at that macro level, it, it wasn't discussed. And I'm sitting here talking to you about a really, really personal thing that happened to me, but I don't care. You know, it's in common discourse, isn't it? Um, you know, it's all about, you know, swapping that information. But sadly, for, for many women in India, they don't have that opportunity. So my next thought was then I need to use marketing, Graham, as a, as a way of transforming, transforming the situation because India does have the technology. It's, you know, it's, it's out there and it's got a really, really skilled young population that can deliver that technology. You found similarities with the work that you were doing in the research uh, that you were uncovering, which is very similar to what Judith was discovering. That is correct. Uh, there is a lot of similarity, there is a lot of overlap, uh, and there is also a lot of enthusiasm. A lot of enthusiasm that sometimes is warranted, sometimes is not. Very often we find that, um, look, I, I spent years of my life looking at educational technology as it was known in those days. Uh, and we got very excited about things and we, we, often, we often looked at the literature on what authors were saying about this. And, and we, we looked at many of these authors were actually enthusiasts, uh, using words like potential a lot, using words like opportunity a lot. And when it came to actual evidence of these things, the potential, the, the evidence wasn't always there when it comes to educational outcomes. So <clears throat> there are a number of myths that we need to, to address. Um, one of which is the notion that technology will equalize, will solve things, and it will solve certain things. But people do solve things rather than tech. What matters really is not the tech, but how we use it, where you use it, who we use it with. And um, uh, education is a very good example where, um, where, where these tools can provide a great deal of opportunity for us, for our learners, for ourselves. Uh, but it can also generate a number of problems. And this is, this is a challenge that I've got for you today. You thought you were going to come here to uh, listen to a panel talk. Well, you have a little task from we me now, uh, in, uh, in, in perfect blended and connected um, fashion, uh, I, will, uh, I will give you a little task. Um, and I, I'd like you to consider this question. Look at the last two and a half years. Consider that. Consider what you've done, what your peers have done, what your students have done, and think again. Has the incorporation of new technology equalized, or has it contributed to the widening of gaps? And I'd like you to reflect on that for a bit. There will be an opportunity at the end to, for you to feed back what you thought about, and that would be a chance for us to think more carefully about enthusiasm versus reality. As Ali said, uh, at the end, I think just before the question and answer session, I'll, I'll put this to you. Uh, give us your answers when it comes to equalizers. Do you think there has been over the last couple of years or not so? Let us know. Now, it is, it is a big question, I know, a big challenge. However, I think this is a really good way, as Ali was saying, to get you involved. Really, really think about the issues that, that we're talking about today. Uh, Judy, if I, if I can come back to yourself. Uh, can we talk a little bit more about the app? I mentioned it to, to our audience a moment ago. What are you working on exactly? Okay, so just to kind of, just to set the scene a bit. Um, once I realised that that was the kind of the research that I wanted to, to develop, I went back to India and, and spoke to those people concerned. And we discovered this, um, what you need to bear in mind is um, with a billion people, uh, 28 states, and there's 15 different languages, there's so many hundred different dialects. You can't just put out a national campaign that says this is, you know, this is all about breast cancer awareness, this is what you need to do. You just can't do that. And so it had to be a, a very kind of hands-on uh, community level. 
And what I discovered was this marvellous set of women, I think you can see some of them around here, which are uh, community nurses. And they're abbreviated as ASHES, uh, Accredited Social Health Activists. And these are women that are local to the community and they were probably born in the villages and they have trusted by the men and they're well known. And they're kind of trained for things like um, childhood immunization, family planning, um, uh, don't, don't eat chewing tobacco, those kinds of things. But when we met them, they were really, really keen on becoming kind of quite instrumental in delivering some kind of intervention service. And they were certainly really interested in becoming upskilled, you know, with, um, with some kind of technology. So we've, it's only at a blueprint stage now, but we've got the buy-in. We know it could work. It's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's transferable, not just to, to breast cancer, but it could be for other... Um, health and well-being issues and the idea is that it's just um, a simple app that nurses can take out with them um, it can store data most importantly it would be very visual so it would overcome the um, the problem of dialect and language it would be um, it's using computer game technology actually which you might be familiar with um, um, and uh, it's sort of showing the makeup of a breast and and the you know the early warning signs the different kind of things to look out for but because these women will be delivering it it's um, much more accepted so um, so that's really good and and discovering that means that where it's all failing at the macro level where the institutions at the top aren't really with their policy directing in, in my particular research context they're not directing money into women's health and the woman at the bottom of the chain you know, at this micro level she's not resourced to sort the problem out herself you know there seems to be this huge gap at this meso level and it could be um, an opportunity for private enterprise to come in and you know uh, sort of finance and help develop these these uh, mobile health interventions at this community level because the women are, are willing and um, you know we we found out the te the technical ability of the user and we found out what the end user the you know Indian women want to see so um, yeah technology if that if that was able to come off and be, um, you know, facilitated could be a great equaliser. And we got to that point and then COVID came. And so, uh, uh, obviously, like every, everything else in the world, you know, the Indian National Health Service is, is playing catch up. So you said this works. You yeah. believe this works. And so this, when you say this works, it means it's, it's, it's going to buying. save people's lives. Yeah. yeah. So how do you go from then Judith Blueprint to actually having an app which people can download, not just women actually, men and women in India yeah. can download. Yes, so what we're looking for now is, is some funding to get some prototype up and running. Um, we, as I say, before COVID, I had two hospitals that were interested in, um, in uh, helping out with it. Um, I've got a co-researcher in India that helps me with the translations and the collecting of the data from from the nurses um, and then of course it was all kind of like held up please uh, Ali if I can come back to yourself I'd love to find out uh, more about the research that you were carrying out because you say from it you found some some key elements which you believe must be addressed many elements must be addressed so I'll, I'll uh, give you a, a, a quick sample of that with some nice words behind us. Um, the first one is context. Um, if your name is Disney or if your name is Netflix, content is king. If you are a university, content should not be king. Context should be. And uh, that again links to my earlier point. What matters is what we do with that content where we do it, particularly why we do it, and who we do it with. In order to grow, we collaborate. As humans, that's what we do. Context is one. We've got fear on screen at the moment. You might wonder, why fear? Well, the jungle is dangerous. 
It's dangerous particularly for two kinds of people. The people who see snakes everywhere and people who don't see snakes at all. And the world of technology is a little bit like that, particularly technology in learning. The next word, well, it's back to context now, but um, we've got, we've got uh, one of the words is learning in there. And it's learning because uh, what is the mission of a university today? Is it to equip our students and graduates with knowledge and skills? Or is it to equip them with hunger so that they can learn what we ignored? I very much think it's a bit of both, but I must not, and I think we must not, forget the latter. And finally, there's integrity. And integrity always, and if in doubt, see above integrity again. You might, you might link integrity to many aspects of student life, of academic life. Uh, I'd like to just highlight one element of this, which might be relevant tonight. Uh, if you go to a number of freely available websites, you can access artificial intelligence engines that with a few choices that you make, half a dozen keywords, choice of style, formal, informal, academic, persuasive, etc., and a type of target audience, within seconds you generate, or it generates for you, an essay. An essay that, if you look at it, it's quite credible. Not only that, but an essay that will most likely go undetected by plagiarism detection engines. As you can see, integrity and fear can actually work together. This is quite scary. What does that say about assessment? What will that say about assessment? I'm sure Tom will have a view on this. Actually, that's a really, uh, really interesting point. I I'm aware of some research carried out by a professor uh, at Oxford called Patricia Kingori. And what she looks at is, or one of the areas she looks at is fake essays. Uh, and the research she's done in particular was looking at the fake essay industry in Kenya where there are, according to her research, about 40,000 40, people who will write essays on demand for you. It's, it, uh, and you uh, now, so it's interesting to think that that set of AI, as it, as it sort of uh, rolls out and as people start to use it, uh, not only does it have an impact on universities because people will, will start to use it and are using it and so forth, <laughs> it'll also have an impact on the livelihood of 40,000 people <laughs> who are currently re relying on, uh, on people in the West asking them to write essays. So it's fascinating how, you know, the, the sort of unintended or unexpected consequences of this um, are, are very interesting. And... And it's, it's odd because there are, there'll be people there who are absolutely relying on <laughs> being able to write essays in order to pay their rent and so forth. So you've got this sort of really odd kind of, yeah, it's, it's really bad from an integrity point of view. And as a result of solving it, um, or as a result of the AI that will come into play, you will, it will really impact the lives and livelihoods of some people that are engaged in it. And I think that it may be that universities and other centers of learning need to think in quite a fundamental way about what, how, how, do you, how do you do your job uh, in terms of assessing people in a world where the notion of learning comes to an end and then I hand something over to you in order to prove that I've learned that stuff. If that's taken away from you, then how do you do your job? So you, you have to decide what problem you're going to try and fix here. Are you going to try and fix the problem of trying to stop those individuals and that AI from producing that thing that I hand over? Or are you going to think about, in not, not necessarily immediately, but in 10 years' time, 
the notion that you will be able to have a learning system that at some point relies on me, the learner, handing something to you and you accepting that it's come from me and therefore using it to evaluate me, that notion is no longer valid and therefore you've got to think about how, you, how the organisation adapts to that. And I think it's more likely that universities will find themselves in that scenario and other centres of learning. It's more likely that is the, few, is the problem that they're going to have to wrestle with rather than the problem of how do we stop these AIs. Because the AI that you see today writing this sort of stuff will be so much better in two years' time, three years' time, five years' time. Unbelievably, the pace of development of that AI will mean that even the signals that you might be able to see today to say it's an AI that wrote it versus that it's a person that wrote it, in five years' time, in ten years' time, you literally will not be able to, to tell the difference and that AI will just be freely available. So I think that they'll have to give up on the notion that you can hand things over and, and rely on it and find some other way of interacting with students that tells you where they've got, you, got to in their learning. So interesting. So it could really change the way students are taught at university, potentially. OK, so Tom, I want to put your, your, you know, your University of Portsmouth challenge to you mm -hmm. when it comes to technology. Is it the great equaliser, in your opinion? I think technology is a, is a huge, huge force for good, and it is definitely... Um, a, it, it definitely helps in equalising. You know, my, I have a girls' science and technology academy in Ghana, an all-girls science and technology academy that I set up that takes young women from across Africa and they come to us and, and learn and so forth. When COVID hit, we had to send them back to their homes very quickly. But because of the technology that we had available, they were able to continue learning. A few years ago, that would have been the end of their education, but now it isn't. And therefore, technology clearly is having a positive impact uh, on their lives. I think the challenge is when certain groups of people are not in the rooms where new classes of technology are being developed, then you potentially run into problems where people just can't see the cultural assumptions and biases that are being built into the technology, built into the algorithms. You know, algorithmic bias uh, will become as important, if not more important, than institutional bias or individual bias has been in the past. Um, and the way that we'll have to wrestle with that, I think, is by making sure that you have real diversity in the rooms, in the organisations that are creating the next set of technologies. And I think if we have that, then we stand a chance of having technology as more of an equalising force rather than a divisive force. So I'm worried that it, it could be more divisive and so forth, but I think there are solutions that, that could address that.